thank you for taking your Saturday afternoon and joining us. We are over the moon with your presence here. Really enjoy the fact that SPNN has opened up their space and allowed us to come in and be a good neighbor, basically. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you to the crew. And this is basically an hour long of just really getting to know who In Black Inc. is. In Black Inc. has started in 2016 in terms of the idea, the thought of this agency that would help create spaces where stories of people of African descent can be harnessed, shared, archived, published, and all those different things. Because we knew that our stories existed in Minnesota, but we also knew that they were limited in terms of how far they were able to reach the people that we knew in terms of our families, as well as our neighbors, our classmates, our colleagues. So we want to say thank you to my husband here, a neuro CSR. I didn't even introduce myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> my name is Raquette CSR. I'm the. Uh, I'm the executive director for In Black Inc. This is a neuro CSR. Hello. He is my partner in crime, uh, the unpaid staff that everybody needs <laughs> in every event. Um, I couldn't do this without him. I actually uh, started, we started with a community um, event in terms of community coming together and requesting what they wanted to see in terms of publishing our works. We know that nationwide publishing agencies are very, 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 very white and oftentimes don't really tell authentic stories about people of African descent as well as other people from other cultures. So this was our small um, contribution to this field in terms of trying to make sure that our people are heard, seen, understood, and elevated at the same time. Um, with all that said, I want to say this gathering is just really a way to get to know what we do. And you can see there's a few different um, artifacts hanging around here that actually tell a little about our story. Um, once we started, what we decided that we would do was just really look at stories that are not being archived, stories that are not being uh, collected, like elder stories. There's lots of elders that have contributed their life work to this community, to the state community, and are passing daily. And we're not capturing what role they have played in building the state of Minnesota. So In Black Inc. is a statewide publishing arts initiative. We're not just a publisher. We don't publish you know, random books. We actually create opportunities for people of African descent to learn how to edit to learn how to write, to learn how to do layout and desktop publishing, as well as how to put all those things together in a publication, as well as how to archive our own uh, community's artistic creative works. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of initiatives that I'll just talk briefly about before I bring up a couple of people. but. Um, last year with COVID, I know everybody kind of had to move a little differently and think a little differently. So reaching out to some of the local, the other local publishers that exist in the community, um, myself and Mary Tarris, who is the executive director and publisher for Strive Publishing, came together and talked about doing a collaborative. They're, from the time we started as In Black Inc. to the time, to presently actually, there have been a couple of other smaller agencies that's popped up and we wanted to make sure that we were reaching out to each other and working together. So we have the um, Minnesota Black Publishing Arts Collaborative, which is one of our um, collaborative working agencies where we do um, writers and authors events. Uh, right now we've been doing a series of um, panels of authors. We've done authors of African descent who were born in the Caribbean, authors of African descent who were bar born on the continents of Africa, authors of African descent that are born here, whose family may have been here 25 plus generations, 
authors of African descent who are of biracial and multi-ethnic um, heritage, as well as just a open forum, which will be in January to kind of round off all of our events, where we'll be talking a lot about identity, which is the basis of all of those panel discussions that we've had. There's one offered practically each month. Um, we have two remaining and then the final discussion. So we hope you'll check out our websites and our Facebook pages and hit like, of course, and then um, you know check out and see what's coming next. The other thing that we have, I know we have a couple of signage around here. There's an event that's coming up in November for us called the Sankofa Series and Event. And it actually is a collective conference, but it's a fun conference. You know, you think of conferences, you think you go, you sit down with a notebook and you write all day. This isn't it. You come, there's music, there's live music, there's entertainment in terms of, you know, singer, poet, whatever it is the entertainment might be. We have um, food, of course, and then there's, a, it's centered around a theme that then it, a publication comes out of. Last, 2019, I think was the last one we did due to COVID. The focus was African um, education, and this was the publication that we actually um, completed from that. It was edited by one of our local historians, Elder Mahmoud El Kati, and it was con there was contributions from ten local um, educators in our community, including Elder Mary K. Boyd and her grandson. Um, there was Dr. Brewer. There's Elder Josie Johnson. So people who we hear from, but we don't always read, a, you know, their work. So we want to make sure we capture that in print. The other thing we really focus on doing throughout the school year is making sure these works, these um, publications that we do have live, not just in the books, but actually do conferences in schools. Uh, a couple of years ago, again, we had what we called a literacy conference in a couple of the local um, public schools where they would do like based on grades, might be from third to fifth grade, the author, the illustrator, the community um, elder who inspired some of the writing come in and talk about their experience, read from the books, do a little workshop on how do you edit, how do you, how do you um, illustrate your story, how do you collect those artworks and make that um, publishable. But with all that said, we are busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days plus a year. And it's good because we know that this is necessary and this is needed. And we hope that people see the richness and the um, need for this to be multiplied and duplicated in all areas. But um, without any further ado, I want to really introduce, um, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. We have a massive database that's coming up at the end of the year. Um, I, please, again, go to our website, check things out. We've been collecting authors, all published or printed um, black authors in the Minnesota state area. So not just the Twin Cities in the whole state of Minnesota who have had some significant time or spent some significant time here. And we provide the listing of all of what they've published, um, an image of who they are, and just some background on their publications, primarily because one of the things we found in the publishing industry, they've said that it's we don't exist, black authors don't exist. And as we can see, we do exist. There's lots out there from children's books all the way to docudrama type um, nonfiction, all the different areas. So do keep you know posted to our website and check to see what we have available. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce a young lady. Now this young lady is a resident of the Rondo neighborhood area. She is one of the authors of one of our first books. Um, the book was called Mr. Rondo's Spirit. She is an educator, an actress, a, um, a little of everything. She has a beautiful voice, just really in terms of her speaking voice, and really um, created 
what is almost like a very poetic book, but provides a really nice chronological history of the Rondo area in terms of the interruption through I-94 that came in uh, several, well, several decades back. But um, Erica Dennis is one of our first um, that we've published, and I want her to just talk a little about her process working with In Black Ink. Thank you, Sister Raquette and Brother Honora. Um, so I had the honor and the privilege of writing a book to bring words and life to the existence of black people in the Rondo community. My family are lifelong residents of Rondo, and I too am a lifelong resident. My grandmother raised her children here, and I raised my children, my husband and I raised our children here. And so I knew some, some things about Rondo, and there were other things that I didn't know about Rondo that when I was um, had the honor to write the book, I was able to do some research and learn more about where my people came from, who my people were and are, the struggles and the beauty that we have gone through and what has made us who we are. And so I work at Brock and Michelle Obama Elementary and I knew that this book was gonna be for young people, and so I wanted to find out what do the young people know about the Rondo community. And I found that many of the children knew about Rondo days. And that really was mostly what they knew about. They didn't know how Rondo days began, why it existed, and why it was important. They just knew that it was a great time to come together with family and friends and that people would come from all across the state and across the nation to come back to Minnesota and remember Rondo. But what is Rondo and who were the Rondo people in the community? They really, they really didn't know and I thought, all right, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk about what they do know. I wanna have that as part of it so that they have that framework. Oh yes, that's me, I know that but then I wanna bring in some things that they don't know and that they should know just to try to keep our story alive and help us to understand that we are more than where we are right now, all right? So I wanted to uh, talk about, so that's part of my process. So I would talk to the children and ask them what they knew. I would write some things and I'd ask them, did you understand what I just read to you? And they was like, well, Maybe a little bit, well, what about that? And then I was like, okay, let me go back and I would rewrite and then I would send stuff to Sister Riquette and she was like, I like that part, can you finish that part? What about this? And I was like, okay. And then I would, I would so I did a lot of listening. I did a lot of talking to people. I did a lot of reading. And then I had to figure out, how do you put all of this together into a few pages that children and families may want to read, will gain a lot of information from. And so that took a lot of time to figure that part out. Like, how am I gonna do that? How is that all gonna work? And so then I was like, I really wanted the story to have the rhythm, a rhythm. So it's like, it's our rhythm. It's our, it's the way we move, it's the way we group. And so I decided, all right, I'm gonna do a rhyme scheme here. And so I'm gonna read a little bit. This is Mr. Rondo's Spirit, a story about a man and his community. This is towards the middle of the book. The book starts out telling you about who the people were in the community and how beautiful the community was and, and how people work together and all of that and the education levels of the people. And then this is the part where the highway comes through. So. Lurking in the shadows, state leaders have a plan to build a long highway through miles and miles of land. They destroy a neighborhood they call a slum because the people who live there earn less income. So lots of cars can drive from place to place. A strong black neighborhood will be erased. Rondo homes will be bulldozed. 
That's the plan the state chose. Highway 94 winds through Minnesota, 259 miles or more between Wisconsin and North Dakota. Of the 1,600 highways created by this nation, 1,394 destroyed black populations. The highway cut through the main street, forcing stores to be closed permanently. These miles of roads built for fast transportation pushed black neighborhoods into mass migration. So that's a part of the story. So I found that the children knew where I-94 was, but they were shocked and appalled to hear that there used to be houses right there and that those houses were bulldozed and that families were forced to move and that many families just never came back. And they had so many questions and they really got um, very upset that this was a reality. But they also felt really proud that their people were so strong, are so strong and are so resilient. And I would talk to them about you need to remember, I'll read that last part. This is the part that really was for me. I wanted some kind of a mantra for the children to remember that out of everything, beauty exists. And you just keep moving forward and you do your part. No matter what happens around you, you keep stepping. So at the end of the story, this story is being read by a teacher. Um, to her students, and it says, when times get hard, as they often do, remember to stay focused, and in time with action, the universe will support you through the power of attraction. Knowledge is your power. Education is your tool. Do your brain's chores, then no one can take what is rightfully yours. So that's the overall message that I really wanted young people and really all of us to remember. Um, so the other, so I've been asked to um, write a, another book um, about Dr. Thelma Buckner, a lifelong um, resident of, she came from Mississippi, but she spent a long part of her life here in the Rondo community in Minnesota. She lived to be 89 years old. She just recently died in 2021. But we're not, she's really, death is not the right term because this is a woman who knew how important her life was, that she wrote two books about her life so that not just her children would have that living legacy, but that we would have that living legacy. And I, I, the main, one big thing I really have learned by doing the research about her life is to know that your life matters. To know that you don't have to go and do what some people think are these big, huge things. That it are, it's the little things you do along the way that makes these big, huge things. And, and that's what Dr. Buckner really understood. And so um, she was a, a child of sharecroppers who went many years, at one point, four years of work, four years of work, day in, day out, and didn't get paid a dime, a dime. Her family taught her resilience, work hard. No one's going to give you anything. But Demand what's rightfully yours. And so she lived a life of service. Um, her family is a long line of, of, of preachers, ministers. And the story, the chapter that she kind of left, that she started and wanted to have continued to tell the story was about when she and her brother opened a camp for young people who were having a hard time in life. And she thought, you know what? And he thought also, 
we got to do something about this. And she had no background in how to run a camp. She had fostered over 1,000 children. So she knew how to work with children. So she figured, well, I got that part down. And the other parts, God will lead the way. And that's how she lived her life, believing that if I am in service for God and I just keep putting one foot in front of the other, the path will reveal itself. And that's how she lived her life. She, her brother bought 32 acres of land in Ball Club, Minnesota. And he asked her, will you be the camp director? And she's like, OK, OK. And they set to getting that work done. They brought children up from Atlanta during the 80s when many of our young people in Atlanta were being um, killed, murdered, um, you know, about the Atlanta boys. So I had been doing some research around that. She brought children. They went down to Atlanta and said, we have a place in Minnesota that's going to be safe for your children. You, will you let us bring them up? And family said, yes. And they came up and they spent that summer in Minnesota. And they were able to be out in the woods. And they were be able to um, be a, by the Mississippi. So that's the, the story that's being worked on now. And it's been an honor to be with in Black Ink and do whatever work they will allow me to do. Because these are two of the hardest working people that I honestly know. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Well, thank you guys. We wanna um, make sure Brian and Dennis feel the love because we are feeling your love. <laughs> the vibrations are in the space, thank you. Um, I am really excited about, um, well, I wanna thank Erica first of all. Uh, she has been a wonderful, wonderful, um, partner in terms of really identifying places where our voices need to be amplified. Whether it be the voice of a child, the voice of an elder, the voice of, you know, just our voices in places that it reside in the way she writes. So I love listening to her write and it's just musical. Um, with that, I want to really introduce this young lady. Um, she has brought to us um, a level of just really looking at the work that we do in very practical terms. We recently, the new release that we helped um, publish was Root Wisdom, wi excuse me, Root Wisdom from the Elders Circle. And this process of publishing Root Wisdom has been really, really um, eye-opening for us because out of that process, we found that we were able to introduce different levels of publishing arts 
experiences for people. So the two editors that participated in the process were two young women who are not professional editors, but worked under a professional editor that we hired so that they can, as apprentice, learn the process and actually um, elevate their level of skills and understanding. So it was an extended period of time, so we really are thankful to Jacqueline for being patient and allowing us to use her work as a way to go through this process. And so um, I'm going to say their names. They're not able to be here today, but Ambresia Frazier and Urabia CSR. Um, one is in grad school. The other one is just doing a lot, <laughs> always. But um, they, they actually helped the, the whole broke the project to come together, which was really magical. We also had people coming out of the woodworks offering to do illustrative images in the book. So we got um, one of um, our beloved Minnesota artists, Setu Jones, who um, said, hey, I just want to you know, help out where I can. And he did a few of the illustrations that are featured in the book. Christopher Aaron Dean, one of the um, members of the Million Artist Movement, did the other set of images that's featured in the book. Both of them are lovely, very timely, very um, cohesive in terms of how they help Jacqueline tell her story. With all that, I want to um, not introduce Jacqueline. I want to introduce the person that actually introduced me to Jacqueline <laughs> Maddox. Um, who said, you know, I know this young lady who is just really, I mean, she's got something in terms of her understanding of this esoteric, you know, life that we're trying to live, you know, because a lot of us are guided by vibrations and spirit and just, you know, um, the exchange of the universe. And so her story was such that she has, you can tell there's been a lot of study, um, but Elder Atum Azahir, who is one of my elders, all-time elders, one of the first people I met when I came to Minnesota, um, introduced me to Jacqueline Maddox. And she said that, you know, we got to look at this. And so if Elder Atum tells me to look at something, I'm going to look at it. <laughs> because her, her opinion is just, I mean, I, I have the highest opinion and the highest um, honor for this elder because of the work and the level of detail she pay attention to. So I knew that whatever she brought had to be like really profound. And so really appreciated her introduction to the sister and her vibrations. You know, she uses the blues to, you know, get us, but she get us in other ways. So Elder Tum, if you can come up here. up everyone. Uh, I want Jackie to know my sister, my uh, now idol writer, uh, to know that um, it's been very difficult for me to believe that she actually wanted me to do uh, the foreword. So I kept saying to to uh, Sister Raquette, are you sure that she wants me to do this? Um, and it's because Jacqueline, my sister again, is really carrying a lot of what I've carried as it relates to uh, being um, a teacher, being a thought leader, being intellectual, being uh, able to stand uh, side by side with those who have uh, surrounded us, both of us, from academic worlds and uh, research worlds and people who have credentials um, an arm and a foot long set of credentials who both of us hang out with on a regular basis. 
But it didn't occur to me until we met and started to talk that both of us were being silent and silenced by people who actually declared they respected us in spite of the fact that they had all these degrees. So it has been a very um, amazing experience. It is the express purpose of Root Wisdom from the Elder Circle by Jacqueline Maddock to allow ancestral knowledge of old and current times to speak for itself through her life experiences. This is an important book which comes from a re-emerging, gifted, self-taught shamanic healer. Jacqueline shares a collection of sacred stories of transformation and becoming. We hear the songs of her life as symbolic of an ever-widening circle of those who love such knowledge. She speaks of the doubt of feeling not sufficiently equipped to study the knowledge of the ancients or follow the examples of those people who are keepers of the original knowledge and philosophies. For Jacqueline to survive, she described the forces that demanded her, demanded her to go inward to the enduring soul. She names the blues as the carrier of her capacity for endurance. As we study with elders, we see it as the collective unconscious practices of the African and other elder cultural knowledge systems that have been severely attacked. She sees that. We see that. We know it. Yet they still remain as an anchor to the enduring soul that evoked the sound of music that caused Jacqueline and others of African heritage to survive, including me. The returning of our intellectual heritage, culture, and spirituality is highlighted in this book. As Jacqueline states, the past may not hold all the answers we seek, but maybe, just maybe, if we look backward deep enough, we will find the true meaning of the hieroglyphs, the cave paintings and petroglyphs of our collective forebearers. Maybe, just maybe, those pictographs were messages left intentionally as a kind of transmission for future generations somewhere in those ancient communication there lies a blueprint if we modern humans pay close attention enough to it, we may find the groundwork upon which to build our future civilization. What is powerful about that statement, as I read it, and as I looked at the amazing research, personal research, this is personal research, I've studied studied and studied myself as we got to know each other, we were able to find. You will find here that as she uh, begins to talk about her um, epiphany, you have to read that, that epiphany, where all of a sudden she actually didn't know what had happened. But she knew what had happened was permanent. It was out of her control. She had nothing to do with it. And as a matter of fact, it then took her on this journey that we now will be able to enjoy as a teaching for all of us, all of us who have continued to wonder, what are my instincts? What is this intuitive knowing that I have? What is this feeling, this sensitivity that I have to something that is unseen? This is what this is about. These are the people, Jacqueline is one of them, who for ancient times 
from ancient times, from what we call the Septepi, the beginning. These are the words and concepts and ideas that are now referred to as, one, once again, metaphysics or metaphysical. And she describes it in very accessible language, very accessible examples. So I want to thank you so much for giving me the opportunity, first of all, to be a part of it. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to endorse something that is so much a part of my own life and my own work that it wasn't a question of do I endorse or do I participate, but do I get the opportunity to be a part of this. I think she has set a, an example that Sister Riquette tells me that I'll be able to follow now. So the next time you're here two years from now, it'll be my book. Thank you all so very much. I'm just going to quickly say thank you, Elder Mother Atum. Um, Mother Atum is actually the executive director for the Cultural Wellness Center in Minneapolis that does amazing work. But without further ado, we're going to have our author, writer, blues, doctor, come up. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you all for coming. And I see uh, my KFAI family is represented in the audience as well, and I just am so pleased I don't know what to do. Blanche from FUBAR's Omniverse, and uh, Wendy Gaskill from the Board of Directors, and uh, it's just marvelous. There's even a young lady here who, uh, if she's still here, her name is Michelle, there she is, whose husband is a producer of Mini Culture, which is uh, one of the programs that we run at KFAI. I am a DJ at KFAI, is why all the references to the blues, I'm a blues DJ there. I'm also a producer here at SPNN, and that's the first thing I want to do is thank Martin Ludden and Steve Brunsberg of SPNN for allowing us to come into their space. We couldn't do this without them. And I also want to uh, address your, your, your view to the stage. On guitar and the suit, <laughs> with a beautiful tie, Mr. Brian Dyke on guitar. The gentleman on the bass guitar, if he bears a slight resemblance to me, there's a reason. That's my little brother, Dennis Maddox on bass. He was also the first proofreader of the manuscript. When I was finished writing it, I, I was like, does this thing even make sense? And I took it to Dennis, because that's just what we do in my family. Uh, there's four of us girls, and he's the youngest one. But as I say in the book, he has since become the rock of our family after the passing of our mother and father. So all four of us are the older sisters, but we depend on Dennis. One more time, Dennis James Maddox. Now I'm going to take my glasses off, because I can't read with my glasses on, so I'm going to remove them. And um, if I'm squinting at you guys, then you'll understand why. But the first and foremost, I want to read the dedication to my book. Because my son David is here in the house somewhere, and he is represented in the, de the dedication. This book is dedicated to my sons, Christopher Maddox and David Freelix, whose courage, support, and enduring love made this book possible. My spirituality materialized because I needed to give them something solid to hold on to during their everyday battle with hemophilia B. As I developed an authentic spiritual life, that same soulful authenticity manifested in them. And because of that, I knew I couldn't half step. I had to learn how to not just talk the talk, I had to learn how to walk the walk. Hence the research, hence looking back and looking forward. There he is, David Freelix right there. It's my baby. 
My other son, Christopher, is not with us because he's involved in a Zoom meeting uh, with the hemophilia community right now. And if you have questions about that, you can ask me or David later. We, we got stories to tell about hemophilia. I'm going to read a little bit from Root Wisdom because uh, I know our time is, is set and I wanted to keep uh, my promise to everyone. I'm a good producer in that way. I'm like, keep, keep it short, but keep it poignant, I hope. The cover for this book was actually designed by me and Sister Riquette, CSR. We were looking for something that said root, said people, and said, come, pick me up. And so we designed the man or woman, the being whose feet are the roots and whose head is Africa and whose hair or the leaves of the tree are all the continents that exist on this earth. As you can see, thank you, thank you. I chose the color though purposefully because I knew it would pop for my blues audience as my market audience and I, I knew they would love the color and every single person I've talked to say, oh, I love the cover of your book. So I'm glad that that went right where we wanted it to go. It did it. Thank you for choosing to read Root Wisdom from the Elder Circle. Although I've been to college, I don't have a string of alphabets after my name. I have even been to a couple of trade schools and yes, I have learned a couple of trades. But that's not what I want to share with you today. What I have to share today is knowledge you can't get in college. Not in the conventional sense of the word anyway. It's knowledge from the school of hard knocks. This knowledge is called gnosis in the metaphysical world and is empirical because it comes from my own 65 years of experience and from my own trial and error. And now, in the time-honored tradition of a craftsman handing down his or her secrets to an apprentice, I want to share this information with you. What I want you to know is what I have learned about magic. Now, don't let that word scare you or put you off. It means different things to different people. What I mean by the term magic is that which constitutes spirit, consciousness, and energy. In the idiom of author and anthropologist Don Carlos Castaneda, we can even call it power. Because all those concepts of power, magic, consciousness, energy, and spirit are one and the same. They are all ways to describe the numinous, the mystical, and the supernatural world of the metaphysical. This book is about their interdependence and what you will be capable of doing and being once you grasp the significance of this information. Let me put it this way. A religious person is someone who believes in a higher power. That's acceptable to you. A sage, a mystic, or philosopher is someone who not only believes, but has had an epiphany, an unshakable experience that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that a higher power exists. But a shaman, a root worker, a magus, or a magician is someone who not only believes and has had proof of a higher power, but also knows what to do with that information. This book is intended to help you act on spiritual information, and when you have finished reading this book, you will have learned how and when to put the information into practice. You will have also learned the purpose of the spiritual information. This book is intended as a kind of blueprint to help you use the following spiritual information appropriately and to map out a way of being that allows you to live in harmony and in alignment with the eye in the sky. You will form a mutual relationship with a great creator that allows you to tap into universal energy 
And it is that connection that will allow you to draw down the blessings. You will be able to walk the path, so to speak, a path that will be guided by the light of the cosmic principle. And when you do so, you will also learn how to create a world that includes every component you desire, as long as those desires are in harmony with the sacred, the divine, the higher power, the cosmic consciousness, or the Tao, the source of all energy. You can call it what you will or give it any name you choose, but it is that which is behind all spiritual disciplines, all religious doctrines, all conventional creeds, and all orthodox systems of mainstream belief. And if you find that you are indeed willing to stand unaided before that cosmic soul self, before the omnipotent sentient life force, then you will be the recipient of the continual flow of empowering energy that is tangible it is malleable, and it's alive with possibilities. That flow of energy has been called by many things. It's known as grace, as chi, as prana, as blessings, and as the kundalini. But it doesn't matter what it's called. You just need to know that it exists, and it is this phenomena that I call magic. How you get there is through the root wisdom that the elders have left behind for us. That's my first reading. We're going to take a pause to hear a little bit of music, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A if anyone has any questions. So Dennis and Brian Dyke, a little bit of music. Thank you. Also, don't forget, we got a lot of food that needs to be eaten. <laughs> there's also cans of water. There's some bottles of water. I think there's juice over there as well. Please partake. We'll be back in a minute. Thank you. 
thank you all for hanging around. I wanted to take a moment so I can collect my publishers because I want to thank them in your presence. Brian Dyke on guitar, Dennis Maddox on bass. What I was reading to you was the uh, pieces of paper that became the book. So it was the final manuscript. And it didn't have this acknowledgment in it. So I wanted to take a minute so I could find it. And I want to be sure you folks understood this. I'd like to thank my publisher in Black Ink and Anura and Riquette CSR, the husband and wife team that guided my path through the several years it took to get this project into print. We experienced personal setbacks and economic obstacles that would have frustrated most fledgling writers, but Mr. and Mrs. CSR kept their eyes on the prize, keeping me focused on the inner light that would take me from dream to the physical materialization of eight years of effort. They believed in me as much as I believed in them, and together we produced this written blueprint that touches our combined heritage and leaves a legacy for all of those who can read in between the lines empowered by black ink. Mr. and Mrs. CSR. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> She's making us say thank you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> thank so, you. Yeah. It's all about them. You're gonna yeah. tell we're gonna do a QA now. Yep. And and you're gonna run it, right? Oh, okay. Yes, everybody. <laughs> now if you have any questions, uh, please don't be shy. Of either author, because Miss Dennis is here as well, Steve. Yep, or any questions about In Black Ink, um, Root Wisdom from and the Elder Circle. Son? My son David has the microphone and he's going to make sure that you're, you're heard. So if anybody has a question, raise your hand and we'll get the All microphone right. to you. I'm not going to see your hand. You might have to just say something. That oh, light's yes. kind of bright. <laughs> yeah, so my question uh, is just kind of a, a general question. Um, in today's world, do you think the younger generation lacks cultural appreciation? And if so, why? To, to who if it's a general question? Uh, to the publishers? The yeah, and publishers. <laughs> Well, I would not say that the younger generation lacks, would you say, cultural appreciation? Because being that they are the younger generation, they have parents and grandparents, and I'm sure they have learned to uh, respect those parents and grandparents. So they have cultural appreciation, but maybe their world has become so much more technological than our world was that they might rely a little bit heavily on artifacts, on toys, on those kind of mechanical things that they hold in their hand, and they don't treasure their grandparents or even great-grandparents and just sit and listen to them talk as much as they will 10 years from now, because then they'll be the elders of their family. Anyone? Yeah, that's right. Everyone turns old school. That's right. Anyone else have a question? The book took me, I started in 2012 to start writing the book. And it, it, yeah, it took, it took a while to get it together because my process, and I'm sure Miss Dennis is, because she's more, she's a younger person and more technologically adept, I hand wrote it. I hand wrote it. I just got one of those black and white composition books and just sat down, started writing. I wrote, I wrote, I wrote, I wrote. It was just flowing out of me. It didn't make any difference whether it was grammatically correct or if it was a run-on sentence. It didn't matter. I was just writing, 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 writing. I did, I filled like two of those. Then I went back, read it, corrected it, still in pencil. And yes, I write in pencil with an eraser and just went through it again. That, the second time, I went through it another time. Then finally, I put it on the computer and just wrote down what I had written. Then I went back again and then did the, the grammatical corrections. You know, where does a sentence end? Where should an apostrophe be? All that kind of stuff. When I finally did that, that's when I took it to my brother and said, read this. Tell me, does it make sense? And he came back to me with a, a great deal of feedback. Like, no, that sentence doesn't make sense. No, put this here. No, that goes there. And finally, when that was done, so I'm up to what? Five drafts. Took it back to him. 
He read it over again and said, okay, now make it make sense to somebody other than me. Because I'm preaching to the choir, right? So I had to go back again. So as you can see, that's why it took eight years to do this, but it was a total labor of love. We have someone with a question. I'm glad I'm not on camera. Uh, my question is about books in general. Um, if you all could talk about your passion for books, because some people think you know it's a dying, it's a dying art form, and um, I you know love to write myself and love to read. So the actual process of making books, making making books or writing a book, because I I tell you I love books so much. I have my sons writing. I made them write because their battle with hemophilia has taken us into some very dangerous territory. And a lot of it is things that they could not express verbally because it was painful. And then it would bring the trauma back. So I taught them to write it. And now both my sons write. One is a poet, and that young man back there, he's a, he's a rapper. <laughs> but rapping is writing. I think that's one of the reasons why In Black Ink uh, was started. One of the reasons was because um, the book industry is going down in a sense. Um, if you have a book written by a black person, for example, unless you're, you know, uh, Cornell West, you know, some of these famous, you know, national recognized authors, um, the likelihood that your book like sells, 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 where you get a certain percentage and all this stuff is uh, not likely. And so, but that shouldn't be a deterrent to, for people writing. Um, in Black Ink sees writing as a cultural practice, actually. Um, it's like passing down the cultural DNA to your family and to the other generations. So we see it as a necessary uh, aspect of living, of one of the principles that you raise your children with. And so to get the stories from the elders or from your parents and your grandparents, um, we have to institute that in a cultural sense, and that's what we want to do. And so that's why the stories that we have, you know, they may not be number one in New York Times, but uh, they're very important in our library and in Black Ink. We have all these writers of African heritage from Minnesota that's passing down these jewels, these knowledge, this culture, these traditions, these customs, this wisdom, and that's what's going to hold us, you know. Um, and so everybody actually. You know, it's not a choice, really. We have to write. So you have to write uh, for your daughter, you know. Um, that's the only way you can transmit that, that, you know, the other elements and dimensions of your spirit. You know, you got the tangible connection, but the knowledge piece, the experiences of future, they don't know that. That's why we're so discombobulated right now as a community. We don't know each other. We don't know who we belong to. We don't know who we're connected to. We're finding new things that shouldn't be new to us. Oh, you related to me? What? What? You know, it shouldn't be like that. We should know that. And it should be written down, not just the oral tradition. We're oral people, but we're also a literary people in terms of writing, too. Thank you. Thank you. And also, the, the better you write, the better you think. Trust me on that. And we have a, a quick question. Miss Wendy. Where can I buy these books? <laughs> Funny you should ask. What's, what is, what's the website? In Black Ink. I N B L A C K Inc. I N K not C at um what is it? O-R-G. Yeah, dot org. O R G. <laughs> and then we all so you can go on there. We have a bookstore. You can buy it there, or you can call or email us. There's a lot of people that just stop by because we're in the neighborhood. We're right at 938 Selby Avenue, which is right in the back of Golden Time. So if you're in the neighborhood and you want to stop in, we also carry books out of our office there. But thank you for asking. Any other questions? Any other? Yes, uh, David? Yep. This is Blanche from KFAI's FUBAR right. Omniverse. That was great to have you on uh, thank you. the show. Thank you so for having me. I had a question for Ms. Dennis. I don't and know she's if right you wanna... there. Yes. Ma uh, Ma'am, would you please come up? And I think maybe it applies to In Black Ink as well, but it's in particular, Ms. Dennis. So um, my, my comment and question 
Um, in recent weeks, I've been reading about similar stories to Rondo across the United States. <laughs> A recent example is discussion in New Orleans about the impact of uh, Interstate 10 across New Orleans. And Claiborne Avenue is an example of, another example of what happened. It's, it's New Orleans um, Rondo. And um, then I'm reading about uh, South Carolina. There's a brand new highway going in where another black community is impacted. And it seems to me that your book and these journalists and historians that are telling this story it seems like it's time for a national conference on this. And I, I think you could be a leader for children, for young people, to understand the impact of displacement in communities, but also have that strength of community and coming together. So it's just a, what do you think about that? I think that's a, power, that's a powerful thought. I think that um, it is necessary for us to have many national conversations around what's happening to the African American community, authentic conversations, and ones that lead to some real action so that um, our community can see um, some reparations. Um, so if I can be of help in any kind of way, I humbly accept. <laughs> so. I just wanted to say, I love that um, you're making those connections because those connections have existed for a while. And that's one of the things that I love about Erica is um, the way she studied that process of 94 wasn't just 94, it was across the nation. Um, that line that you say across the nation, it was 1,600 highways, 1,600 plus that went in and 1,300 destroyed black communities. And that's not just housing, that's businesses, that's you know all those different things that people need to be independent. And so when we take on a project, we take on a project knowing that it has ripples and it has um, reach in terms of not just what's going on, even though we're a statewide initiative, we connect nationally and internationally with the same people that are experiencing the same experience in their locales. And so, yeah, that's an awesome idea. That's a wonderful thought, definitely. I think we're all always kind of projecting our thought to where we're looking at what would be the ripple from this. And yeah, I think a national conversation has been happening. Um, and just real quickly, I know like three years ago, we went to a conference in um, where was the Gordon Park? Oh, oh, Fort Scott. Um, and talking to a couple of uh, residents or participants in the conference we were at, and same thing. They were like, oh, our community had that experience. Our community. So it is definitely something that we wake up and go to sleep thinking about in terms of how our experience here in Minnesota is not unique to just us and how can we actually reach other communities with the things that we write and talk about. So thank you for that. So in closing, and we're gonna ask Dennis and Brian if they will give us some music as we close, but uh, a precipitate from the book that I would like you to take with you is um, people have often asked me because I talk about this stuff as often as I can and whenever I can. Oh, we have a question. Yeah. yeah, my question, I'll try to make it as quick as possible. Uh, there are a couple of books, I'm sure, that would come out of my family. I don't know where to start. My daughter and I have uh, a story, a story we think that will help others. And um, my nephew and uh, we have a story that relates to adoption, Lake Adney and uh, the black family in Rondo. So you just started your story. What you just said to us, say it again on paper. Write it down. You just started it. That's the beginning of your story. And then what? 
<laughs> keep writing. It'll, each sentence will suggest the next sentence. You just did it. You s talk to, on paper with a pencil and a piece of paper just like you were talking to us here. You just did it. Okay. Every single thing you said. Have you wrote it already? Okay, okay, got it. Have you written it actually? I've got some pieces, my daughter's got some pieces, and yeah. my nephew, we've got some pieces. You we got it. Meet. We can yeah. meet with you. Okay, thank you. Because it's time for us to wrap up here, folks. I want to thank SPNN for having us here. And as I was saying, folks have often asked me, how do I identify myself? Who, who do I see myself as? And I see myself as a, as a shaman, shaman, shaman. Uh, there's a word called shamanka that comes out of the, uh, the Ural Mountains and it is a, a terminology for a female who is a shaman. And with that in mind, I want to give you a precipitate from the book to take with you as we get ready to close. The following affirmation is a combination of Buddhist thought, uh, warrior, sorcerer, philosophy, and my own observations. Take this with you. And you say to yourself, or you say to others at a time of stress, because it's all always and always will be about how you see yourself, because that's how you then translate your thought, your energy, your magic to others. It always starts with you. May us sentient beings be free from animosity, free from trouble, and free from oppression. May they care for themselves with ease. Say that. And it will help you in your struggles or in your continuing uh, communications with other people. May the best outcome prevail and may the highest good be obtained. And may all those that I touch and all those that touch me find joy, compassion, and loving kindness. Thank you all for coming today and sharing your loving kindness with us. Thank you. Brian Dyke and Dennis Maddox. Thank you all for coming. Thank mm -hmm. you.